I am very blessed tonight to be able to introduce an anointed woman of God, one uh, that I've got to know for about 42 years now, and we have three kids and seven grandkids, and we travel the nations of the earth, and we co-pastor Vision Church, a Christian international right here, and uh, are also uh, able to travel as an apostolic prophetic team uh, into the nations of the earth as we just returned from uh, Korea and the earlier in the last year. Norway and on and on different places that God gives us the opportunity to go and so uh, she has written as I said many books many resources uh, been a conference speaker around the nations of the earth and really is one of the keen prophetic voices in the earth today and so we're privileged to be able to receive what God has given to her for 2023 give a big hand clap and a welcome to Apostle Jane Hammond in the house <laughs> thank you honey it's always terrifying when he enters introduces me. So <laughs> um, those of you that are watching online, I think you'll find that we do have a live audience with us tonight as well. So uh, we're very blessed to have you guys here. Um, I know that Bishop had a live, a live crowd last night. Uh, we had um, just a few of us here to cheer Apostle Tom on. Uh, but uh, my husband said he didn't eat a lot, just a few, but it's so great to have you guys tuning in to the ministry tonight. Um, I'm going to ask the people that are here with us tonight, if you don't mind just standing back to your feet, and people that are, maybe you're watching from your kitchen, you're watching from your living room, maybe from your office, if you don't mind standing to your feet as well. Um, you know, something that I was always praying about this ministry tonight, um, we're in 2020. 23 or 5783 on the Hebrew calendar. And that is the number three is considered to be the number of the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I was reading something the other night that I thought was really fascinating uh, because we know that in John chapter 16, the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, if I don't go away, you know, then I can't send the Holy Spirit to you. So I'm going to go away. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you and he will be your helper is the way that it's translated. And we know from studying the, the Greek that that is the word paraclete. Paraclete means one that walks alongside. Um, it also is a reference to somebody that becomes your advocate, like in a court of law or in the courts of heaven. He stands up for you. He makes a case for you. He he wars for you. He fights for you. He, he, he takes your side. How many are glad that Jesus takes your side? But it was very interesting. I was reading in the, in the, uh, the Passion Translation, and I love the way that Brian Simmons goes in and looks at some of these words as they're written in Aramaic. And we know the word paraclete, that's the Greek, but in uh, in the, the Aramaic, it's the word uh, parakleta, parakleta, and it's two words, parak, which means the one who removes or destroys, and leta means the curse. The Holy Spirit is one who removes the curse. He destroys the curse. And I believe that we are going to see such a release of curse-breaking, yoke-destroying, anointing released in and through his people this year. And I'm telling you what, we've been already in some incredible battles this year. But I'm telling you that when we come through a battle, there's always victory on the other side. Because he is the God of victory. He's the God that fights for me. Amen? And I, I just want to declare to you, Numbers chapter 23, there's a story where Balaam, who is this, and uh, he, he is this prophet that actually is the only prophet that gave a messianic prophecy in the book of Numbers, but Jesus calls him a false prophet because he eventually kind of leads, you know, Israel astray. But there's this evil king, his name is Balak. Balak's name means the destroyer. And Balak hired Balaam and said, I want you to come and I want you to curse God's people. And you know the whole story, the donkeys, you know, saw the angel and standing in the path and you know that whole story. And the donkey spoke to him and said, you know, why can't you see this angel, okay? <laughs> um, and so, and so he, Balaam went ahead and went, but God said, you can't say anything that I haven't said. And so Balak was saying, I want you to curse them. And he said, I cannot curse 
whom God has blessed. And I can't curse this people because the shout of the king is in their midst. And I want to declare to you right now that you cannot be cursed. Number one, Jesus became a curse for you. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And his name is the one that breaks or removes the curse. So if you feel like the enemy's trying to come against you, if you feel like the enemy's trying to heap all kinds of stuff on you, I'm telling you the Holy Ghost lives inside of you. He's the one that breaks the curse and just like the enemy comes and tries to put a curse on you I decree to you tonight you cannot be cursed because the shout of the king is in your midst so I want you to give a shout to the Lord I want you to shout unto God with the sound of victory I want you to shout unto God with the sound of triumph this is a year of victory this is a year of triumph regardless of what you're going through Jesus is fighting for you the Holy Ghost is rising up inside of you and he's breaking you free from every curse. Hallelujah. The paraclete, the paracleta is coming upon you and is destroying every yoke, every curse that the enemy would try to bring. Amen. We decree that over you right now in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Well, as we approach this year, Apostle Tom and I, basically, we kind of studied some things out together. And so uh, those of you that heard him last night, you'll hear a little bit of an overlap in some of the things that God's really laid on our heart. But I'm going to go to Psalms 23. And it's what's been so interesting is that um, just about every prophet that I've listened to has made some reference to Psalms 23 this year. How many of you have... Psalms 23 memorized. Have you memorized it? It's a good one to memorize if you haven't memorized it yet. Um, but you know, I think it's interesting is that Psalms 23 comes right between Psalms 22, which is the psalm all about the pain of the cross where David cried out and it was became the words of Jesus where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I know the bishop told us on Wednesday night that we can't ask God why, but how many of you have ever been in a situation where you felt like maybe God had forsaken you, okay? So the pain of your process, the pain of whatever you've gone through, the pain of your cross that you're enduring, that's Psalms 22. But then Psalms 24 is this psalm of victory. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. So right between the pain and the victory is Psalms 23. Because I think Psalms 23 really helps us to position our heart and position our expectation for all the things that God is desiring to do in this next season of time. And so we're going to we're going to go through that and then I'm going to share some things in the middle of it that I really believe is the time and season that God has us in right now as the church. And so we know the very first line of Psalms 23 and you can say it with me if you know it. The Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. So I'm going to break that into two parts, okay? Because I think that God's speaking some things prophetically to us about the fact that he is our shepherd. In the Hebrew, that is the word ra'ah um, or rohai, which also can be translated, he is my best friend. See, I think that to just start this year off, let me just say God wants to baptize us in love. He wants to bring us again into that place of intimacy, into that place of, um, of not just working for him, but living in love relationship with him. And I think that really when you look at John chapter 10 and Jesus is saying, you know, I am the good shepherd. And he begins to talk all about how his role as a shepherd. And it's this beautiful picture of this symbiotic relationship between the shepherd and his sheep. And you really get this picture of how much the shepherd loves the sheep. He actually says the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. But then he also makes this other statement. He says, my sheep hear my voice. And so I believe that 
at the very beginning of this year, when we just start off and we say, the Lord is my shepherd, we're talking about diving in and refreshing and renewing our first love. We're talking about tuning our ear to the sound of the shepherd. We're talking about in the middle of John chapter 10, when he's talking all about the shepherd, he says, listen, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come <laughs> that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. This is that relationship with the shepherd. And we can actually see Jesus rising up as the good shepherd. I, I think that this whole picture is, yes, it's very pastoral. It's very, um, it's very loving. It's very kind. But I believe it's also very apostolic and it's also very prophetic. Um, my husband just mentioned that we got back from Korea and I want to share a vision that I had my very first day in Korea. I arrived early in the morning and had basically a full day to get a little nap and get up and pray and, and look and see what the Lord was saying. And I had this vision and I shared it for Korea, but I really do believe that it's the heart of God for his people throughout the earth. Um, I saw the Lord like the heavens were open and I saw God just like raining kisses down on his people. And, you know, I was, uh, I, yeah, I was very touched by that because God's love, God's affection for us are very real. And I think, you know, perfect love casts out fear. And when we're rooted and grounded in love, then it, it, it breaks every stronghold of fear off of our life. And it really does become this place of amazing empowerment. So as I saw these kisses falling, um, they were landing on members of the ecclesia. They were landing on people that were his, his chosen people, his, 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 his bride, the, those that he loved. And then I saw the kisses also falling like it was on the land. And when it went, whenever it would fall on a person, it was like their heart would burst into flame just this amazing passion, this amazing love that he's renewing in us this year, this first love anointing. But then as the, as the kisses fell and they landed on the land, I saw the, the fire spring up in the land. And then I saw this, this, this amazing fire springing up and the people would go and they'd reach into the fire and they'd pull out a sword. They'd pull out a rod of authority. And it was like this, this love that he was pouring out on us was so so empowering. So I began to look this word kisses up in the Hebrew and just one of my favorite little verses, Psalms 85, 10, it says mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And I, I just love that, that imagery. I love that picture. And so I looked up the word kisses and in the Hebrew, it's a word that means to kiss, to show affection. It means to fasten upon Honey, <laughs> um, <laughs> he felt the anointing in that. Okay, um, but <laughs> but it also goes on to mean something else. Listen to this: it means to kiss, to fasten upon. It means to equip with weapons of war. The word kiss means to equip with weapons of war. It means to empower you to rule. And then when you go to the root of that word, it means to light a fire. So how many believe God wants to light a fire in his church this year? That his love, his passion for us should just spark this amazing first love experience in our hearts and in our lives. Again, just lift up your hands right where you are. Father, I thank you right now, God, that wherever people are hearing this, God, you're just touching them right now, God, with your tender love, your tender compassion. God, you're breaking us free from every spirit of fear, knowing that you are our shepherd. Lord, knowing that you're watching out for us, knowing that you're intimately uh, involved with us. God, that out of that relationship, God, you're giving us weapons for war. You're giving us, uh, you're giving us an empowerment to rule and you're lighting that fire of passion, that first love inside of us for the future, for 2023 and for all that is ahead. God, it's going to be what anchors us for everything else. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I just, I, I really want that just to sink in and just let the love of God just touch your heart right now, wherever you are. Because then it says, because the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. And you heard this from Apostle Tom last night, that the word want in that passage means I shall not lack. I shall not have a need. I shall not be without. I shall not decrease. Come on, the enemy wants to cause high inflation, high interest rates, this and that, shaking in the economy. And yes, it's going to continue to shake. But listen to this declaration. Because the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not decrease. I shall not fail. I shall not be grieved. And Apostle Tom shared that he looked up this word, twenty, this number 2023 in the uh, concordance. And the number 2023 for the year 2023 in the Greek is the word epikoregio. And epikoregio actually has this meaning. It means to furnish, to abundantly furnish or supply. It means to lavishly supply your needs. Just lift up your hands. God is saying, because I'm your shepherd, I'm going to lavishly supply your need. I'm going to lavishly, abundantly furnish you for everything that you need to accomplish everything God is asking of you this year. And come on, God is shifting us out of a poverty, lack mentality, out of a not enough mentality into a more than enough anointing. I just decree that over you right now. And, and we just we take you back to the to the Hebrew year 5783 the 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 three in the Hebrew year in the Hebrew alphabet is the the word gamel and gamel several different translations of it one of them is the picture of a camel don't turn to somebody and say you look like a camel okay don't do that all right you'll get in trouble um but Gamel, the camel, actually, um, it was a picture of the transfer of wealth. That's how they accommodated wealth coming into the land. And as a matter of fact, Isaiah 60, after the whole passage that you heard Bishop preach on, on Wednesday night, that talks about that darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness, the people, but the Lord will rise on you. His glory will be seen on you. Then the nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. And then a few chapters later, it says the camels are coming. So I decree to you this year, the camels are coming. There is an abundant supply that God will bring to his people for whatever it is he's called you to. But this word gamel also has this very interesting meaning. It means recompense or benefit. So this is where God wants to give to us. Gamel is really kind of the picture of this wealthy benefactor chasing down somebody that's in need and heaping blessing upon them, heaping abundance upon them. Um, and, and as I began to receive that from the Lord, then the Lord said, you know what, though, you're Gamel. You've been the, the recipients of a wealthy benefactor. Now you get to chase down others that are in need and you need to heal the sick. You need to raise the dead. You need to cast out devils. You need to be the abundant supply of heaven over their lives. You are Gamel. Be Gamel this year. But it also means recompense. You know what recompense means? It means to pay. Now, God will recompense you for your sacrifice. God will recompense you for what you've poured out. But let me just also say this. God will recompense the enemy. In other words, it means payback. <laughs> and I tell you what, the enemy's done some things recently that I am ready to make the devil pay. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to make the devil pay. I'm ready to see God bring justice and see God bring recompense into the land. So I want you just to lift your hands and I'm going to make this decree over you because the Lord is our shepherd our best friend who loves us and is affectionate towards us because of that, 
We are equipped with weapons of war. We are empowered to rule. We are on fire for the kingdom of God, on fire for the purposes of God. And we have no lack. We have no want. We have no needs that he has not abundantly, lavishly supplied. We're not going to fail. We're not going to decrease. We're not going to get stuck in grief. But we're going to succeed. We're going to overcome. We're going to triumph. This is going to be a year in 2020. 23 that we're entering into victory come on no matter what you're facing it's a year of victory and I declare that over you now in Jesus name amen and amen so the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters he restores my soul. The Passion Translation says he restores and revives my life. This is kind of the picture. This verse is kind of the picture of somebody that's kind of been through it, right? Somebody that's a little bit exhausted, a little bit weary, gone through some challenging situations, maybe a little bit worn out. How many of you felt just a little bit worn out? I know you're like, oh, I'm too tired to raise my hand. Yes, that's you. That's you. You're the ones that I'm talking to, okay? And he's saying, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refresh you. I'm going to restore you. Um, I, I looked up this word restore. I love words. I love to get in there and study and dig and just look at the meaning of words. And listen to what this word restore means in the Hebrew. And, and I didn't pick and choose these words. These words are the words that are there in the Strong's Concordance. Restore means to refresh, to rescue, to repair, to return, to reverse, to recompense, to reward, and to rejoice. Let me read those again. Maybe lift your hands and receive. <laughs> to restore, to refresh, to rescue you, to repair what's broken, to return you to a previous wonderful state that God's got you in, to cause a reversal, divine turnarounds, divine reversals, to cause prodigals to come back, prodigal situations, prodigal children, prodigal friends, prodigals from the Lord. Come on, God's turning them around. He's bringing reversal. He's bringing a recompense, a payback season against the enemy where we make the devil pay. He's bringing a season of reward. Come on, there's nothing wrong with believing God for reward. Reward for your sowing, reward for your praying, reward for your faithfulness, reward for your diligence. And then, of course, the last word, rejoice. It's going to be a year of rejoicing. We just got to set our heart to rejoice. Set our heart to rejoice, no matter what's coming, no matter what's come against you. Do we believe what we just sang, that God can take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good? Deuteronomy 23, 5 says the curse is turned to a blessing for you because he loves you. Come on, when we really believe that he loves us, then the curse gets turned to a blessing for us. Amen? So as I, as I prayed into this, as I was praying about this year, I, I, you know, I really felt like it was really important for us to really discern the time that we're in, in this season of restoration, this season of, of, of recompense, this time that we're entering into, and this, this, this year of the Holy Spirit. And I started thinking, first of all, about the vision that I had back in 2020, and those of you that have heard me preach on this before would remember the white stone vision. And in this vision, I saw Jesus, I saw, you know, a line of believers as far as I could look on the right, on the left, and as far on the right. And I saw Jesus approaching each one of us. And as he would approach us, we put out our hand. And when we put out our hand, he put a white stone in the palm of our hand. And he closed my hand over it, kind of looked me in the eye, and he was doing this with each one kind of looked me in the eye and kind of nodded his head. He didn't say anything, but she kind of was like, I got this. Okay, and then he'd go to the next person. And so, of course, when I studied out the white stone, I found Revelations chapter 2, verse 17, which says, to him who overcomes. Come on, <laughs> that, that should have been a clue about what 2020 was going to be about, okay? <laughs> People say, well, you know, uh, uh, you didn't prophesy about the... The, the plague. You didn't prophesy about COVID-19. 
But you know, when you're prophetic, you got to understand that when God says start something like to him who overcomes, you got to understand there's probably something we're going to have to overcome. So this was January of 2020 and it says to him who overcomes, I'll give you to eat of the hidden manna. That's, that's the bread that comes down from heaven. I think that's revelation. God says, when we overcome, he gives us revelation in the midst of the overcoming. But then it goes on to say that he will give him a white stone with a name written on it that only he knows. So it really becomes the white stone of the overcomer. Because you see, in the old Greek athletic games, and if you'll remember, the Olympics came out of Greece, what they would do when somebody would win at one of the athletic events is they didn't give them a medal to hang around their neck. They didn't give them a trophy to sit on their shelf at home. No, they gave them this little white stone with their name engraved on it. And this was, they would give them the victor's crown, Okay, that, that was spoken about. The, and they would give them this white stone of the overcomer or the winner or the one that triumphs. That's what that word, it's actually the word Nike. Okay, so some of you need that motivation, just do it. Okay, <laughs> but, but they would be given this white stone and they would be able to put it in their pouch or their pocket and they carried it with them everywhere they went. Why? Because that white stone became, as it were, like a ticket or a pass that gave that previously common citizen now access to all of the upper echelon of society. It became like a pass into uh, banquets, into athletic events, into um, uh, uh, um, political events, whatever it was that was going on in the city that was not accessible to the common person was now made accessible to the person that was the overcomer. And so the Lord was saying, listen, you're going you're gonna to go through some things, but I'm going to cause you to overcome if you'll keep your eyes on me. And then I'm going to give you access to things that maybe you would never have had access to before because you've overcome. Now, at the beginning of 2020, everywhere I traveled, I passed out white stones to everybody, commending them. Praise God, you're an overcomer. And then March 2020 came around, and I realized that God wasn't commending us with that vision. He was prophesying to us with that vision. He was like, here's a white stone. You're going to have to look at this white stone. You're going to have to remember that I said this to you, because you're going to face some of the challenge, most challenging situations of your life. And you're going to have to remember that I've chosen you, and I've called you to be an overcomer. And here we are, church, stronger than ever. Come on, the devil overplayed his hand. We're stronger than ever. We're ready to conquer. We're ready to move forward. We're ready to gain access to those places that maybe we didn't have access to before. Amen? So as I was praying about this third year of this decade of overcoming, the Lord said these words to me. He said, prepare yourself for the third day revolution. Prepare yourself for the third day revolution. Now, this phrase, third day, I'm going to focus on it for just a moment. Because I think that if we're going to hear from the Lord, where the Lord's saying, I want to restore your soul. The purpose of him restoring our soul is to get us ready for what he wants to do. To get us ready to become that ecclesia, that, that conquering force, that yoke-destroying army that God wants to release into the earth. So he's saying, you need to get your soul restored so that you can pre be prepared to enter in to this third-day revolution. So as I began to study this, um, I, you know, I, I realized, you know, that the biggest thing about the third day is that Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. Not the second day, not the fourth day. It was very specific about the third day. As a matter of fact, he prophesied that he would die and be raised again on the third day, I think five different times. It's just that his disciples were like, yeah, I'm sure that's just some kind of allegory. Okay, they didn't really believe he was going to die. They didn't really believe he was going to go to his death and then be raised again. They thought it was probably just some kind of allegory. He tried to tell them, but he said, I will be raised on the third day. 
He was very specific about it because when you actually read the Bible, you actually see that there is something that, that scholars call the third day pattern. A third day pattern. Because throughout the scripture, you'll, you're going to find this phrase on the third day. And I'm going to share a few of those with you tonight. But always on the third day, it became a time when God came down and intervened in the course of life, in the course of history, in the course of circumstances of people's lives, and turn things around to salvation, turn things around to overcoming, turn things around to favor, turn things around to taking back what the enemy had stolen. And I'm telling you that God is saying that we're in a third day moment of resurrection life. Jesus was raised. And, and let me just say, if you're struggling with something in your body, Scripture says in Romans chapter 8, it says, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken our mortal bodies. Come on, that quickening anointing will quicken the cells in your mortal bodies, in, in, your, in your joints, in your organs, in your brain, in your lungs. There's a quickening anointing that's being released right now to bring our bodies into a place of living in resurrection life. Now, I studied this mid-December. Apostle Tom and I even did a recording for Chuck Pierce before we left to go on our Christmas break. And, uh, you know, sometimes God gives you a word that you don't really realize is going to be a prophecy to you. How many like prophecy? That's good, okay? We war a warfare with the prophecy. But I was all prepared to preach all about resurrection power, not realizing what we were just getting ready to face. Without going into a lot of detail, we took our family of 14 to Colorado for a snow vacation. A lot of our grandkids had never seen snow, so we had saved up miles uh, through all the COVID-19 thing, and we were able to actually use our miles and take our family out uh, to a snow vacation. But on our way out there, our 12-year-old granddaughter, Brielle, actually suffered from a medical emergency. I'm not gonna go into the details, but she had a medical emergency, and when we landed in Denver, the paramedics had to come onto the plane and take her off the plane and take her by ambulance uh, from the tarmac straight to a children's hospital in Denver. This is not the way you want to start a vacation. We always tell our church people, you got to pray for us as hard when we're on vacation as when we're out ministering in the nations, okay? And so she was in the hospital three days. She's doing great. She's doing fine now. They came and joined us. We had some amazing days in the snow. And then on our way home, we were just boarded the plane to go back and to, to go Denver to Atlanta. And as we boarded the plane, we because we're a tribe, they let us board early. And um, Apostle Tom and I were boarding, were in towards the front and, and with a couple of other members of our party. And um, most everybody else was, you know, moving towards the back. And within a minute of boarding, they came on the loudspeaker and they said, medical emergency in the back of the plane. We jumped to our feet, and we, the family members were, were calling us, and of course we thought that little Brielle was having another problem. And as we started running back there, they said, no, it's Tiffany. And Tiffany had collapsed and was, was having a medical crisis, and in the middle of that medical crisis, she stopped breathing. And we had to call life back into her. For our local church people, that's Pastor Tiffany. So guess what? When you start preaching and hearing God say it's going to be a year of resurrection life. I didn't really plan on having to speak life into our own daughter to call life back into her, but God brought life back into her. Come on. God raised her up. God gave her back her life, but the paramedics had to come on the plane and take her off the plane and take her to a hospital the same way that they'd had to take her daughter just a week before. Now, does that sound like the devil to you? Let me say this. The devil is going to pay for that. The devil is going to pay in each of their lives. The devil's going to pay because everywhere I go, I'm going to cast him out. Everywhere I go, we're going to release resurrection life. Healing and miracles and power is going to happen this year. I am telling you, the devil is going to pay for what he just did. And it says, if you catch a thief, there's a scripture that says he must restore double. There's another scripture that says he has got to restore seven times. And doggone it, honey, he ruined our vacation. So he owes me seven. 
seven vacations. Why not? Come on. That the devil has to pay for. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, guys? We just we got to quit letting the devil just get away with stuff. We got to demand that he pays, right? And so, but I but I want to I want to remind you that we can't be cursed because the shout of the king is in our midst. So we came home on uh, December the 31st and, and all this while this word about resurrection power was rolling in my spirit. And then on January the 2nd, I left to go to Korea. I left about a week ahead of Apostle Tom. And on, while I was in Atlanta, um, Sunday night football was going on. And the whole nation that watches football at least, watched a scene that most people are not going to forget. And they watched a man um, named DeMar Hamlin um, collapse on the field, and they had to minister um, CPR and life-saving measures to him for nine minutes. And you know, by if any of you saw that, you know that he dropped dead on that field. And you know what? I was, I was riding in the train in the airport to Atlanta, and I was talking to Apostle Tom about it, and I said, wouldn't it be awesome to see God raise this man up? Wouldn't it be awesome that as everybody's bowing their knee and praying all through that studio, all through that stadium, wouldn't it be awesome to see resurrection life come into that young man? Now, they took him off the field, 24 years old, dropping dead of a, of a heart attack. They had to resuscitate him back two different times on the field. But you know what? Something interesting happened. Because he didn't die, okay, he was in critical condition, but people sent me, maybe Sunday I'll show some of these, but somebody sent me a clip of the sportscaster, and he was saying, you know, I mean, our thoughts and prayers go out to him and his family, and matter of fact, you know what, We're, let's just do this, let's do it right now, God, we thank you. And he bows his head, and he starts praying on a sports cast and asking God to heal this man. Sports teams for the next week continued to pray, continued to press in. I want to remind you, DeMar Hamlin's number is number three. Come on, number three. <laughs> and this super cool thing happened the next week. This super cool thing. Okay, so um, a couple of teams were, uh, were playing. I forget which teams it were, but that were playing. And they had dedicated the game to DeMar Hamlin. And was it the Bills? I think it was the Bills that were playing. And they dedicated the, team, the game to DeMar Hamlin. And in that game, um, they actually took a kickoff and ran it all the way back for a touchdown that day. The initial kickoff of that game, they ran the kickoff back for a touchdown. And listen to this. That was the, that was the Buffalo Bills. It had been three years and three months since the last time they had done that. Y'all, that's just cool, okay? That's just really cool. And then the next week you saw the number threes from different teams coming out and joining hands in center field and all the teams hitting their knees. Come on. I, I, you know, there was a lot of controversy about people kneeling at the NFL, but let me tell you, there's no controversy this time that when teams are hitting their knees praying that God would raise up a young man that died on the field. And guess what? DeMar Hamlin is alive and well today. He's returned to the Buffalo Bills practice room and is having conversations with them. He's rehabbing. But can we thank the Lord that an entire nation watch God raise this young man up. Amen. I think it's God just drawing a huge exclamation point and saying, I want you to pay attention. This is a third day miracle. This is a resurrection life miracle that God is raising up in this day and time. And Josh Allen, who is the, the Buffalo Bill quarterback, um, I, ju I just been following this story. Um, he gave an emotional statement and he gave all the glory to God. And this is what he said. He said, this whole thing was just spiritual. He said, I was going around to my team and saying, God is real. God is real. 
He's like, I was not the best of Christians before, but I'm telling you, God is real. Come on, can the whole world hear out of this situation that God is real, that Jesus is raised from the dead? He's not some dead teacher. He's not some dead Buddha. He's not some dead God that's buried in a grave somewhere. Jesus is alive. He is resurrected, and that same power lives inside of us. Come on, it's a year of resurrection life. And I think everybody ought to memorize Isaiah 54, 17 that declares this. No weapon formed against you this year will prosper. And every tongue that tries to rise up against you in judgment, you shall condemn. It says this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Resurrection life. Resurrection life to your hopes and your dreams. Resurrection life to the things that the enemy's stolen from you in previous seasons. Divine recovery of everything that the enemy's messed with you about. Amen? Listen to this scripture, Hosea chapter 6, speaking about the third day. Hosea 6, verse 1 and 2, it says, Come, let us return to the Lord. For he is torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Come on, church, we're in the third day. We're in the third millennial since Jesus came to this earth. But I'm telling you what, we're in a third day anointing. It's not just this year. It's what we're living in, but God is emphasizing it this year. The verse 3 goes on to say, Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. He will respond to us as surely as the arrival of dawn or the coming of the rains in the early spring. This is a year to know him, to know him in power, to know him in the dynamics of who he is, and to know that he's a God of resurrection life. Let me just share with you just maybe a few of the passages that have to do with the, ver with the, the little phrase on the third day. Because that's when Jesus said, I'm going to be raised on the third day. It was the fulfillment of all these different passages of scripture. These are just a few of them. In Genesis chapter 22, when um, God spoke to Abraham and told him, take now your son, your only son, and go to Mount Moriah, offer him up as a sacrifice to me. How many know that's, that's a pretty tough thing? I mean, when you realize everything that Abraham went through to get that son, that son, Isaac, was his prophetic promise. It was what everything that God promised to him. I'll make you a father of nations. In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God made promise after promise. He blew it with Ishmael, but God finally gave him his Isaac. And then God said, now take him and sacrifice him. You know what this tells me? It tells me that, uh, that it says that on the third day of the journey, they arrived at the place of testing. They arrived at the place where he had to go up and he had to lay Isaac on that altar. Now, many times we see this story depicted as Abraham taking about a 12-year-old boy on this journey. You realize that Isaac was a grown man? Isaac was like probably in his 30s at this point. So the miracle to me is not just that Abraham obeyed God, but that Isaac went with his dad. Because Isaac could have sure took his father out at that point. Okay, you're going to do what, Dad? No, I don't think so. But Abraham had so instilled a love for God in Isaac that somehow they trusted God that no matter what this looked like, that God was going to come through on the other side. But Abraham had to be willing to go through the test. And let me just say, I know Apostle Tom preached last night and talked about testing. This is going to be a year where God's going to test our hearts. And God's going to say, what do you love? Who do you love? See, what God was looking for in Abraham is he's, he was saying, do you love me more even than what I've prophetically promised you? If I ask you to give up what I promised you, would you do it? No, because we war, we pray, we decree, we stand on the word, we declare the prophecies, we do, all of that. What if God says, I need you to be sure that you love me more than any promise I've given you? 
And if you need to understand this more, go back and listen to Bishop's message on Wednesday night. Okay, these messages really are building. These messages really are all together. They, they, they're, they're bringing forth something that says God wants first place in our life. And God wants the highest priority in our lives is for us to be conformed to the image of Christ, to be obedient above all things. Because you see, when Abraham passed the test, then we see this beautiful picture on the third day of the ram in the thicket, the sacrifice that was provided to be sacrificed in Isaac's place. Come on, it's the first miraculous prophetic picture of the salvation that Jesus was going to bring to become the perfect sacrifice for us. And I mean, you have to see the whole scene. Abraham standing over him with a knife poised to plunge it into his heart, his own son's heart. And you know what God said to him? He said, now I know that you fear me. Now I know. See, I've tested your heart. Now I know that you love me. Now I know that you serve me. Now I know that you put me at the highest priority. Now I know this. And then he says, now, blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your seed and your descendants will possess the gates of your enemy. I want you to lift your hands. Father, I just decree right now, God, the grace to pass the test. God, whatever the test is individually, God, I know that we personally as a family have gone through a test in this last season. God, give us grace to pass it. Give us grace, Father God, to be conformed to your image in the midst of us. Give us grace, Father God, to make sure that we love you more than anything. Give us grace to be willing to be stretched out of our comfort zones, Lord. Give us grace, Father God, to see you lifted up, Lord, as, as, as Abraham did on Mount Moriah, and he called the place. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. God, let us have that kind of trust and faith in you that no matter what we face, God, we know you are Jehovah Jireh and you will provide. And God, that's so much more than just money. It's whatever we need. Give us grace, Lord, on this third day to pass the test and go to the next level. In Jesus' name, amen. How many want that third day anointing to pass the test? Amen. God came down in the middle of it and intervened. Another amazing scripture that speaks about the third day, and I, I can't go through all of these, but I'll, I'll refer to several of them, is in Exodus chapter 19. And it's called the Theophany. And what this is, is when God called Moses up onto the mountain at Mount Sinai, and he met with them there, and then he eventually gave him the Ten Commandments. Do you realize it was the third day on the mountain? It says, on the third day, God spoke to him and said, listen to what the Lord said. This is such a prophetic word for us. It says, prepare yourself for the third day. This is what they said to the people. Prepare yourself for the third day. Sanctify yourselves. God did not give the Ten Suggestions. He gave the Ten Commandments. Come on, prepare yourself for the third day. God gave the law. He provided a way for fallen man to relate to, to God until Jesus could come and be the perfect sacrifice. But it says on that day, on the third day, Moses heard the voice of God. He heard thundering and he saw lightning and he heard the voice like the sound of a trumpet. Just touch your ears. Father, I decree, Lord, that on this, in this third day anointing God, Father, that we are going to prepare our hearts, but you're going to open up our ears, Father God, so that we can hear what it is you're asking us to do. And Lord, so that we, our hearts will be so prepared prepared. Our lives will be so sanctified that we can hear you clearly and we can obey you. God, that it's not just a matter of being a hearer, but a matter of being an obeyer, God, of all that you're speaking to us, Father. Lord, let us hear your voice in this third day. Let us meet with you. Let us be in your presence, oh God. Lord, no matter how <laughs> intimidating it can be sometimes to be in your presence as the fear of God falls upon us, Lord, let us enter in. Let us prepare our hearts. And Father, whatever it is that's in our life, Father, that wants to keep us out of that place of your presence, shame, accusation, 
sin patterns, sin cycles, God. Help us to break free of those so that we can come in, Father, and be prepared, be sanctified, so that we can hear you in a new way in this third day season, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 11, another scripture that says on the third day, talks about how when they came to the river Jordan, on the third day, they crossed in and they possessed the promised land. So this is an anointing to actually possess the things that God has promised. Come on, they had been in captivity for 430 years in Egypt, knowing that God had promised them a land. And then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 more years until that generation died off. And now God says, now is the time going and cross in. And it was on the third day that they crossed in. Then once they got into the promised land, in Joshua chapter 5, it says the third day in the land, the manna ceased. What was the manna? The manna was that bread-like substance that fell from heaven that they got to eat nothing but for 40 years. So on one hand, it's kind of like this great provision came to an end. This supernatural thing came to an end. But here's now something even more supernatural. They got to eat the fruit of their land of promise. They got to eat the milk. They got to eat the honey. They got to partake of the fruits of all those years of waiting. God says, you no long, longer need this manna stuff. You can eat the good of the land. Just lift your hands up, Father. I thank you, God, that there's an anointing this year to possess our promise, to eat the fruit of the promise. God, we decree, Father God, that this year we're shifting out of just battling to survive into battling to possess the promise that you've given to us. Lord, we lay hold of it in Jesus' name in 2023. How many are getting a hold of this understanding of the third day? Let me give you another one. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, that's the story of David at Ziklag. And if you remember what happened, David was off fighting the Philistines. He won victories over the Philistines because Saul wasn't doing his job. And David was winning battles. And after he had this great victory over the Philistines, he started going back to his camp. And on the third day of his journey home, on the third day, David returned to Ziklag. And on that third day, he found that the Amalekites had come in and they'd, he, they'd stolen all their family members, their wives, their children, all their possessions. So it was a day of great grieving. I mean, David's men looked at stoning him. They wanted to stone him. They were so grieved. And David called for the ephod. He said, I'm going to seek the face of God. And it says that David had to encourage himself in the Lord. Don't be surprised this year if you hit a, hit a situation where you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. Here's, here's what I want to say to you. Don't just go into, into the doldrums or into depression or into the woe is me's, okay? Go press in and seek the Lord. Listen to what God is saying. Because here was the directive of the Lord, and I believe this is something we've got to have stamped in our heart this year. The Lord said, here's your, here's your direction, David. <laughs> Pursue overtake and recover all. Say it with me wherever you are. Pursue, overtake, and recover all. And I want you to know that David took that prophetic word and he went and he not only did he get back his wives, his children, not only did he get back the spoil that was stolen from them, but he took everything else that the Amalekites had and he had so much spoil, he brought spoil back to the people that stayed at the camp and he sent spoil to all the surrounding cities. He had an overflow of the spoil of the enemy. He took back so much spoil. So here's the thing. You may face a crisis this year. You probably will. We did. Although that was 2022. Our crisis. Our granddaughter on the uh, Brielle, I think it was on January 1st, uh, she was walking with her Aunt Crystal and JJ did something. Her brother did something. And Crystal goes, JJ, don't do that. You know, things haven't been going well lately. You know, don't do that. And Brielle goes, Aunt Crystal, that was so last year. <laughs> that was so last year. That's not who we are this year. Man, is that an amazing revelation? <laughs> That's so last year, okay? That's not who we are this year. That's what she said on January the 1st. 
But remember, this is a year we're going to make the devil pay. So pursue, overtake, and recover all. That is a word of the Lord. Lift your hands up. Father, I thank you, God, that you are releasing an anointing this year in this third year on this third day, Father God, for us to pursue, overtake, and recover all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me just mention a couple more. I'll, I'll preach some more about this this year, but um, the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, Ezra chapter 6. Esther received favor on the third day, remember when she went to the king? She went before the king. As Esther chapter 5 verse 1 says, on the third day she went before the king. The king stretched out his scepter and gave her favor on that day. Expect amazing favor this year. And there's several other things, but I want to just focus in on, on one last thing about the third day. And then we'll finish the 23rd Psalm in just a couple of minutes. Because Jesus did his very first miracle in John chapter 2 at the wedding in Cana, and guess which day of the wedding Jesus did that, that miracle? On the third day. On the third day, his mom came to him and said, Jesus, they've run out of wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what has that to do with me? I told my son he ever calls me woman. I brought him into this world. I will take him out, okay? Must be something cultural, because I don't think Jesus would disrespect his mother. Woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Just watch this. I love this. I love this. When he says that to her, the next verse, she turns to her servants and she says to them, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, I personally believe there was something that happened between those two verses. Something like Mary saying to Jesus, listen, I am your mother. And you are going to do this for me. That's just my guess, okay? <laughs> but Mary said to the servants, whatever he says to, to you, do it. Jesus had just told her my hour had not yet come. But Mary knew who he was. Mary knew what he carried. And so what did she do? She reached into the future and she pulled it into the now. Come on, so many people are stuck saying someday, 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 someday. And what Mary was doing is she's like, you know, I'm not waiting for someday. I'm reaching into the future. I'm putting a demand on the anointing that I know is in you, and I'm pulling it into the now. She's not waiting for her miracle to come to her. She's going after it. Just like the woman with the issue of blood pressed through the crowd, laid hands on the, uh, on the hem of Jesus' garment, and said, I'm not waiting for you to come to me. I'm coming to you. And I'm laying hold of that anointing for resurrection life. I'm laying hold of that anointing for healings and miracles. This is my time for my miracle. And we need to get that in our spirit. We need to get that in our hearts to say, this is the time. Now is the time for miracles, signs, and wonders. We are living in the third day. We're living in resurrection life, and we're going to put a demand on that. Come on. In the Old Testament, King Hezekiah was dying. This is found in 2 Kings chapter 20. Remember the story? The great reformer, King Hezekiah, he was dying. And Isaiah, the prophet, was sent to him on his deathbed. And here's the great prophecy that he gave him. Set your house in order. You're getting ready to die. Here's your great prophecy. Thank you very much. And it says Hezekiah turned his face to the, to the wall and he began to cry out to God. And Isaiah turned and he left. And before he got out of the palace, the Lord spoke to him. And this is what the Lord said. He said, return. Remember one of the, the meanings of the word restore? Return. Return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. The Lord's just saying to us today, I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. And he says, behold, I will heal you. Now, he had just given him a prophecy. Was it a false prophecy? No. Does God change his mind sometime? Yes. God sent him. Go tell him you're going to die. Now God says, mm, I've changed my mind. Tell him. I'm going to heal him. And listen to this. On the third day, you will go up to the house of the Lord. 
Come on, I'm going to heal you, but you're not going to see it fully manifested till the third day. Well, I'm telling you, there's some of you that have been praying, crying out to God, weeping, crying, pressing in, doing everything that you know prophetically to do, and you're just like, God, when is it going to happen? God's saying, put a demand on the anointing. Reach in and lay hold. On the third day, I'm going to move you into that which is supernatural. I'm going to move you into that which is answering your prayers. I'm going to move you into that which is causing healing to come and relief to come and a turning around to happen in your life. Just lift your hands and receive that. Father, we thank you, God, that you're raising up. God, a restored, revived, favor-filled, miracle-working, ready-for-battle church that's carrying resurrection power, God, as we go in and we start laying hold of our promised land, God. We're going to be a people that pass every test. We're going to be a people, God, that rise up and represent you in the earth, God. Lord, we're going to be that church that carries resurrection power, God, everywhere we go. That, Lord, that that even as there were the, the uh, early apostles raised the dead, even as the prophets of old raise the dead, God. Lord, we're going to hear testimony after testimony of literally dead people being raised back to life, God. We thank you, God, for that resurrection life that's coming forth for your church. In Jesus' name, I want you to receive this and believe it in your heart and say, God, that's me. Amen. We're just through verse 2 of Psalms 23. We we really, I'm going to, I'm going to read the rest and we're going to wrap it up. But it says this, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God's calling us to walk paths of righteousness. And one of the other things that I found about this third day anointing is that there's an anointing for freedom. Uh, It's very cool because in Genesis chapter 40, remember when um, Joseph interpreted the dream of the butler and the baker? And on the third day, they were let out of prison. Remember the interpretation of the dreams was on the third day, okay? On the third day, they were let out of prison. Do you remember the story that when Joseph's brothers came to find him, he ended up putting them in prison. He kind of set them up, was testing them. Do you remember that story? They were put in prison. And on the third day, he let them out of prison. See, I think that there have been people that have been bound, that have been imprisoned, that have been, that have been held in the enemy's grip. And God is declaring on the third day, there is deliverance, there is freedom, there is, there is an anointing to break out of cycles, there's an anointing to be set free. And you know, I was sharing with, uh, with somebody about this that has um, led groups in recovery programs. And she said, just about every recovery program uh, will say that the third day, or the third week, or the third month are the most challenging in the process of healing, in the process of getting free. Because the third day is the, is the point, whether it's the day, the week, or the month, it's the point where somebody has to decide, do I want to go back or do I want to go forward? And there's some of you that God's saying, do you want to go back or do you want to go forward? He will lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But we've got to walk the paths of righteousness. He can lead us, but we've got to walk those paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So there's an anointing. I'm telling you, you may have struggled with things your whole life, but there's an anointing to get set free. The anointing destroys the yoke. The next verse says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When I looked at this, the rod of the shepherd is also called the shepherd's club. It is his weapon of war. Come on. It's what the, what the shepherd uses to not just lead the sheep, but to beat the lion and the bear. Okay, and the staff, that's God bringing that support of every kind. Listen to what the word rod means. It means a shepherd's club, a weapon, a rod of authority, a rod to fight, a rod to rule, and a rod to walk. Come on, this year God is releasing to you a a rod to fight, a rod to rule, and a rod to walk. And God's going to give us supernatural discernment of every plan of the enemy, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He's going to give us discernment so that we know how to fight, how to rule, and how to walk, even when we're walking through that valley of the shadow of death. And then it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with with oil, my cup runs over. 
So suddenly the scene changes. It's no longer this pretty little pastoral scene with shepherds and sheep. Suddenly it's a banqueting table. Apostle Tom mentioned earlier that we've been doing communion for the last three years. I, God wants, God's calling us to his banqueting table. God's calling us to that place of daily communion. He's calling us to overcome by that anointing of the communion table. And then he wants to anoint our head with oil. You know, um, anointing somebody's head with oil was what they would do for distinguished guests. And remember, our shepherd that loves us, he's inviting us to a banqueting table. He's saying, I want to put anointing oil all over your head. Not just, not just to do it, but I want to do it in the presence of, or let's say it this way, in the face of your enemy. I'm going to put it right in your enemy's face. <laughs> I looked up this word enemy, and it means in the face of distress, opposition, affliction, oppression, that which cramps you, that which besieges you, that which troubles you, that which vexes you. And I am telling you, there's no hex, there's no vex, there's no curse, there's no oppression that the love of God cannot deliver you from. The anointing destroys the yoke. The yoke is destroyed because of the anointing. So I've heard people say the yoke is broken. No, that which is broken can be fixed. It actually says the yoke is destroyed because of the anointing. God's delivering us. God's destroying the, the works of the enemy. And this word anoint actually means to be fat. I'm just going to leave that right there. <laughs> I'm pretty good there, okay? To be fat, to be satisfied. It means to take away the ashes of grief. It means to be prosperous. He anoints our head with oil. Oil is the oil that comes from the olives. It's richness. It's anointing. It's fruitfulness. That's what this word means. And we need to remember oil is needed for fire. God wants to light us on fire. My cup, my cup runs over. Cup means the container, the, the, your bag, your purse, or your life. The container of your life runs over. That word runs over means it's satisfaction, to become wealthy, to abundantly fill. Doesn't that sound like lavish supply? It also means to slake one's thirst. Come on. God says, if you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, you shall be filled. Just lift your hands up all over this place. And I just decree right now in the presence of every mocking, threatening, distressing enemy, every enemy that comes to besiege you or trouble you or hex you or vex you. In the presence of your enemies, you make my head prosperous by putting richness and fruitfulness upon me. You take away the ashes of the last season. You take away the grief of the last season. The container of my life and my soul is abundantly satisfied. My spiritual thirst is slaked and my purse is made wealthy. I am anointed with fresh oil so the fire of the Holy Spirit can burn passionately in my life. In the name of Jesus, we decree this over 2023. And if you believe that, just say amen and amen. I'll read the last verse. It says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me in 2023 and all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen, this, this passage is so rich. I'm just skimming the surface. I just really want to encourage you, memorize it, let it go down deep into your soul. And I just want to make this just the, the last and final decree. Listen, there, there'll be shaking this year. There'll be challenges this year. There'll be tests this year. You may even face a crisis this year. But here's the promise. Goodness and mercy are going to follow you. So what is goodness and mercy? Goodness, this is what's going to follow us. Lift your hands up. This is what's going to follow you. No matter what you're going through, this is what's going to follow you. That which is beautiful, happy, cheerful, prosperous, filled with favor, kindness, joyful, that which is precious, sweet, and wealthy. I want you to just say, all these things are going to follow me. 
And mercy means loving kindness, favor, good deeds, mercy and grace from God, pardoning mercy, protecting mercy, sustaining mercy, supplying mercy. I want you to say, this is going to follow me. God's going to turn the curse to a blessing for me in 2023. Amen. Let me just say this. I told you what happened to my family. I told you what happened to Tiffany. And I was sharing this with some of our friends over in Korea when we were there, you know, not even a week later. And I was sharing them, sharing that with them. And one of the ladies from Korea that night brought me a thousand dollar envelope and said, I want you to give this to Pastor Tiffany. And I want her to be blessed because of what she went through. Come on. Now that was the righteous releasing blessing. How much more so is God going to make the devil pay? Amen. So, Father, I decree this year, God, is going to be an amazing year of victory. No matter what we face, God, you're going to give us victory in 2023. I thank you, Father God, for every single person that's pressing in, Lord, that we lay hold on this third day anointing, God, of resurrection life, resurrection power. Lord, we exalt Jesus above all. We exalt Jesus above every circumstance, over every trial, over every every difficulty. God, you're going to turn our trials into triumphs. You're going to turn our, our oppression uh, into opportunities, God. And Lord, you're going, to, you're going to begin to cause that turnaround anointing to be visited upon us on every stage in every day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.